Welcome to Offscreen. This week we're reading Passengers by John Spates. A passenger on an intergalactic spaceship is the only one prematurely thawed out from cryogenic slumber, 90 years before anyone else. Um, so this script has quite the history. It was a really popular script several years ago. It originally, I think, had Keanu Reeves attached okay. um, to star. Uh, it's gone through several casting iterations since then. Presently, Keanu Reeves is still involved, but as a producer. And oh. the male and female leads uh, are set to be played by Chris Pratt and Jennifer Lawrence. Okay. Um... And Morton Tildum, who directed The Imitation Game, is attached oh. to direct. Okay. Um, I know how you feel about that. Yeah, I feel badly about that. The Imitation Game. It's one of 2014's worst movies, in my opinion. Wow. But um, Spates has carved out a pretty successful career for himself, mostly um, off the merits of this. He parlayed it into writing Prometheus for Ridley Scott. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, okay. And is currently writing or has written the screenplay for Doctor Strange, the mm-hmm. Marvel movie starring, I think, Benedict Cumberbatch. Okay. At this point, um, he's also supposedly writing a mummy. The mummy? like A, a The Mummy? Well, you know what I mean, like the like mummy. a Brendan Fraser mummy. Yeah, I don't know. And I, act- same, is I it... actually didn't click like the IMDb link, but I assume okay. there can only be one mummy. Huh. Whether or not Brendan Fraser is involved, I, I in thought the that scene. I thought that franchise was dead, but perhaps not unlike a mummy, uh, it is returning uh, from well, the grave. I think people would have said that Passengers was dead once or twice too, but yeah. look at it now. Been around for a long time. Yeah, it looks like he also wrote a screen pl- or the screenplay for the movie The Darkest Hour, um, but that was. I don't even know what let's that is. Say less than well received. Oh, that's why I haven't heard of it. I yeah. guess. It's neither here nor there. Um, so that's a little bit of a backstory. He seems to be doing quite well for himself. He has yeah. a Twitter. Um, handle and he seems pretty active on it. So you guys should maybe follow <laughs> him there. All the cool screenwriters are big on Twitter these days. And all of you listeners. What? You should. You don't have to push your lifestyle on them of reading like an entire Twitter account a day. Are we going to... Oh, if, if, <laughs> if you, you want to throw in a quick plug for Nihilist for, Arby's? Oh, I love Nihilist Arby's. Um, it's so great. It's yeah. worth making a Twitter account is, just for is, that. It is pretty great. But, okay, so... Should we get right into the summary? Let's get right into the summary. Okay. You ready? Yes, I'm ready. Cool. This is your time. Yeah, my time to shine. Okay. In the distant future, mankind has begun to colonize new planets in search of resources and to escape from an increasingly congested Earth. Next up for habitation is a planet called Homestead 2. The journey takes about 120 years, and so all of the planet's prospective colonists have been cryogenically frozen aboard a state-of-the-art spacecraft called Excelsior. The plan is to unthaw them a few months before arrival, during which time they'll enjoy a kind of cruise vacation. Excelsior is decked out with restaurants, bars, and movie theaters, all managed and run by robot staff. About 30 years into the journey, something goes wrong. One of the cryogenic chambers malfunctions, waking up a passenger named Jim Preston, 90 years before anyone else. A mechanic by trade... Jim sets about studying the inner workings of his sleep chamber. He's unable to repair it, but in the process comes across a fellow passenger named Aurora, beautiful even while frozen. Upon the advice of a robot bartender named Arthur, Jim contrives to wake her up. He makes it look like an accident so that when Aurora comes to, they simply find each other. A seemingly fated coincidence, they immediately bond over their shared life sentence aboard the ship. By this time, Jim has become an expert on all of Excelsior's amenities. He gives Aurora the full tour, showing her the best restaurants and even letting her stay with him in the classiest suite the ship has to offer. Aurora, once a successful journalist, 
was meant to write a piece about the colonists' arrival at Homestead too. Now, as she begins to fall in love, the story shifts to that of her new life with Jim. It's on a date with Jim for her birthday that Arthur, the robot bartender, lets slip the truth that Jim woke her up on purpose. Aurora is shocked by this, but just as her relationship with Jim begins to crumble, so does the ship, literally. As it turns out, a small meteorite had struck the Excelsior a couple years back, triggering Jim's initial wake-up. Ever since then, part of the ship's core has been damaged, with other backup computers gradually trying to compensate and subsequently overloading, one by one. In one final race against the clock, and even gravity at times, as the onboard gravity generator fails, Jim and Aurora are forced forced to work together to save themselves and the ship. It's only decades later, by way of Aurora's continued writings, that the colonists discover the truth about the two people who saved all their lives. The end. Nice. Uh, The ending, I I don't think that's quite right, actually, now that I think about it. Um, I I had a problem with that ending, actually, because I thought it was just going to be... Yeah, they're they're sort of like heroes commemorated after the fact. Um, It's kind of how they play it. But it's not really all the other passengers that discover them, right? Should we say the ending? I don't know if we should spoil the ending Well, all the passengers die, right? Most of them do, don't they? All the all the cryopods start getting shuttled off into space. Yeah, but I, it didn't seem to me that it was all of them. Okay. Well, to explain, when the ship is all like falling apart and everything's going wrong, a bunch of the cryopods are just like blasted Injected. into space. Yeah. I assumed all of them. I assumed the reason that there were still survivors after the fact was that they said something earlier about like how everyone on board had like DNA samples or something like didn't they save like eggs and sperm from all of them or something they said yeah I assume that was how they had repopulated the ship by the time that it arrived but, but who I don't repopulated know. the ship they didn't do it themselves. I, I don't know if there was some automated thing like in in case of an emergency they do that I don't, I, so. I don't know I guess they would have had to explain that better but okay fine yeah. point is I think it, I think we were just supposed to take it that a lot of people's lives were lost but okay some okay. remained not ejected from the spaceship okay. into Fast, fast nothingness of space. All right. Maybe some of those pods drifted their way to a planet somewhere. Who knows? Well, I think they probably would have been... Killed on impact? Yeah, or like burned up when entering the Sequel? atmosphere. Sequel? Of... Sequel, definitely. It's, I think this is a franchise. Yeah, sure. Um, I think uh, if I have one slight qualm with a summary, it understates how much... Uh, Jim agonized over his decision to uh to wake her up to wake her up yeah it's like a big part and he I gloss over a little bit by, by saying that the the robot bartender Arthur kind of like helped convince him he did he did kind of help yep. but Arthur doesn't really have much of a personality I should say like he's kind of there just to bounce off of right he's, he's... programmed to just be friendly and like yeah, just like a friendly presence. He doesn't really contribute he's, much. But he's like a bartender. He like tells you what you need to hear yeah. in that moment. He told yeah. Jim that he should wake her up, and he also told Jim that he that he shouldn't wake her up. That it would be wrong. Just he he told him what he wanted to hear. Yeah, yeah. like and yeah. I like I also like the thing he said about how like Arthur or uh, no Jim mentions at one point like why are you polishing a glass all the time? Like, yeah, you're, I'm your only customer. I'm here like maybe once a day. How can you possibly have any work to do? And he says, Oh, it's like a trick of the trade. You know, you got to look busy. If you're just standing there, the customers will get like creeped out and yeah, feel pressured. Um, anyway, but yeah, yeah, he, he agonized over the decision to wake her up for sure. I mean, he did like, in doing so, he doomed her to the same fate that he was doomed to, which is never reaching Homestead, except in, like, very, very advanced and, age. And never meeting anyone else. Never meeting anyone else. She had planned to go to Homestead, wake up, live there for a year, write her piece, and then return home. She, right. They said that she had booked the only one, uh, round-trip ticket on the right. on the thing, so he really dashed all of her dreams. I feel like if if I were in this situation, I would have just woken up a ton of people. 
not yeah. just not just for like selfish like I need someone to talk to reasons, but like just f- keep waking people up until you find someone useful. Like there's got to be someone that could help them more with this that might be able to fix the cryopods or then might... you're like condemning all these other people to your same fate no that all is these, like innocent that's people that's if you find the, the person you need then they're all saved and it's all fine only if you do but I... they were already saved beforehand they were perfectly fine yeah when he chose to when he chose to wake her up he had no reason to believe that uh that she could help him. Not, or, not only that she him. could help him, but that everything wasn't going to go according to plan and they would, in 90 years, arrive at Homestead sure, sure. and wake up at the, at the same age that... Well, and that that makes that brings us to my biggest problem with this whole story mm-hmm. is the fact that like they, they contrived this whole situation with the meteorite and then the computers gradually failing... And it's timed, of course, really perfectly to coincide with them being at odds with one another right after Aurora learns about him waking her up. So that's that's already a little coincidental. But then the fact that, like, if they had done nothing, if they had all remained in their cryopods as planned, the ship would have just, like, totally fallen apart. Right. And they all pretty much would have died. Right. That seemed like such a fake, like, cop-out way of justifying all of jim's see i don't think it justified it because he had no pre-knowledge of that i know he He didn't but i'm saying just with no reasonable expectation of that's the that's my problem with it it's like i feel like the reason the writer's doing it is so that like on a macro level we see that like oh it's a good thing he did that he saved everyone see i don't i don't take it that way well then what was the point of that whole thing his actions were completely independent of what happened later his he, his choice to wake up Aurora yeah, I know. was completely independent of that. I know, so but I I'm, it doesn't I, for me recontextualize like the morality of his choice. I well yeah I know I know I would disagree with anyone within the world of the story calling him a hero because he saved the ship from destruction. But I'm I'm saying I think the writer was trying to to paint him as a hero for that reason and like realized he needed to do something like that. In order to just have him not be an a hole who screwed up over this lady, he needed a reason for them to both be like lionized, and so he created this situation that that proves that if he hadn't done it in the first place, they but, all would have died. I don't know, but she still she still comes back at him, like basically stating that like you couldn't have known this was happening, right. but I think it would have been almost more poignant if all of that stuff about the ship being you know, like, almost destroyed, if they just took that out and it just ended with, you know, the new colonists waking up and finding the whatever remains or memories left behind by these people, and they were just two people that spent all these years together, and that's that's all there is to it. The, the but thing then about the screenplay is, like, 40 pages shorter. No, it's not. That's like the that's like the big climactic. That wasn't forty pages. But I mean, then you have like forty pages of them like arguing or making up. But that I feel like that's the crux of the story anyway. It's supposed to be a story about a relationship between these two people. It's not supposed to be like a cool action space movie. Yeah, but I think it does pose some really interesting questions about what provides meaning to life, what makes what creates value. I do kind of like the idea, which I didn't think it was purposely like trying to get this across, but okay, well, first off, let me just say it is extremely shallow of him and like kind of messed up that he was judging purely on looks. That was like all he had to go on. Yeah. But that said, I do sort of agree with the idea that in the right circumstances, any two people can come together. I I think the screenplay is... You think that is what it's going for? I think it's strongly cons- uh, it strongly considers that point of view. Yeah. I mean, they fall in love, but do they fall in love? Like, what in- tr- is there something intrinsic to each of them that makes them fall in love with each other? Each other, or is it just merely the fact that they're right. the only two people there? Right. And they feel as though they um, are doomed to die on this ship together. Right. Right. 
when you yeah. have something to like unite you and like something, something you're both struggling against together yeah, yeah it brings you closer whereas if everything is just peachy then it's peachy and there's no adversity for you to overcome together yeah how, how did you feel about all these things that said like three weeks later or three months later I wish they had been like maybe it, it went from like three weeks to like three months to like a year. Yeah. I wish it had been like a set interval of time that it was that was elapsing. Well, I wish even maybe that there were less of them, less jumps. Life doesn't happen in those uniform kind of chunks, Stephen. Well, I, I like I liked it. Yeah, yeah. I kind of. But thought... I mean, most of it was like personal stuff for him. Well, what do, you, what do you mean? Like when he was alone on the ship? Yeah. It was like for the first three weeks, he was like super active trying to find an answer. Then he became resigned to the fact that he couldn't. And he drank every one, every one of the 237 drinks that Arthur the bartender could make. Uh-huh. I, yeah. I liked it though. I thought it like really helped to illustrate the mundanity, I guess, of yeah. of his existence at that time. Certainly. Um, maybe they didn't need to spell it out in, like, actual text how many months or, you know, weeks had passed. Maybe they could have just done a, you know, like a fade to black and a cut or something, you know, mm -hmm. and we could have learned how long it was from contextual clues. That might have been nice. But yeah. In any case, I thought it was kind of nice. Um, I mean, to be honest, overall, I really like the screenplay. Oh, okay. And I think in the hands of a like strong visual director, it could be a great movie. So not the director that it has. Yeah, not... Unfortunately. Not a dude that sticks a camera in front of people in a two-shot, holds it for a <laughs> minute, and then turns it around. And then basically <laughs> just rushes Cliff's Note style through. Oh, man. But that's either here nor there. Maybe we'll reserve he'll judgment. Out. Yeah, I um, will. Um, I'll be skeptical, but hopeful. I didn't see the invitation game, so don't bother. Um, don't bother. I I mean I don't know. I follow, I follow your heart, I guess. I'll wait for it on Netflix or something. Um, but you really liked it overall. I really liked it overall. Did you like? What about like the humor and some of it? Because I there were a few parts that were too much for me. It's a little corny at times. But it is kind of like Castaway esque. It's one dude interacting with non humans for a large part of the screenplay. Right. And then after that, it's two people. What's your point, though, in terms of the humor? I mean, like, you kind of become a little unhinged, perhaps. It seems reasonable for you to be a little unhinged, a little corny, all right. when I'm not all saying... your jokes are, like, unchecked. And okay. I, and I mean, unless. Like, if the movie aspires to have a commercial appeal, which, considering reports that Jennifer Lawrence is set to make and 20 Chris million Pratt. and Chris Pratt 10 million, it clearly does. It's gonna have to have. It's a... gonna have to have the characters. T like, the characters spend so much time alone. Uh huh. They can, even if it's more true to life, they're not gonna sit there in silence. Like, that's not yeah, yeah. feasible for a movie that isn't, you know. There is a joke that that was really dumb. Yeah. He's trying to, like, send a message to anyone. Like, at first he tries to reach the colony planet where they're going mm -hmm. to message somebody or to message the company that runs the ship. And then finally he tries to message, like, Earth. Mm -hmm. And he leaves this, like, sort of recorded message and sends it. And then this message on the machine says, like, that will be $6,000. Yeah, that was kind of lame. That <laughs> yeah. was really on the nose. It was a really stupid cheap. joke. Like, yeah, it's a super long distance call. Ha ha. Well, yeah, and I like, they make a lot about the corporatization of uh, intergalactic travel, right? Uh-huh. This is all privatized. Right. It's all a company making hella bank off of these people's dreams, aspirations, desires for a new life, etc. Yeah. I don't know if you mentioned in the summary, but Gus, the assistant captain that wakes up I did not own... mention that, because that kind of came and went really yeah. fast. Yeah. You want to explain that? Sure. So at some point, several months to a year after uh, he wakes up, Aurora, Aurora. Aurora learns that Jim woke her up intentionally. Uh, another passenger wakes up just by happenstance, just by ship malfunction. 
and he turns out that he's like a captain and not the captain but like the assistant captain and mm-hmm. uh he kind of is the he kind of catalyzes Jim and Aurora seeing each other again because he's this like beacon of renewed hope that they might be able to figure something out right and they work together to first figure some to, to try to figure something out and then also to um fix the ship and he, and he does kind of help them i think just mostly the reason he helps is cuz he has a card with access to other parts of the ship like the technical parts of the ship that they need yeah. to re- where they need to repair things that's pretty much the only reason he existed i guess was to allow them access to those places well there's also like a nice thought about like cooperation and like did he have like a preachy line he didn't have a he didn't have a preachy line but he was he brought them hope when they lost hope yeah and he put them in the same room together you know and then he promptly dies of some illness he dies because his incubator or what is it hibernation chamber thing like malfunctioned really bad um, but I thought it was interesting, and I think this is something the movie does a really good job of is, and maybe it's not that super hard in space, but it really gives a sense of like the vastness, like the infinite vastness of space and the smallness mm-hmm. of people within it. And then we later learn that what causes all of this is just a tiny, tiny meteor. Yeah. So like, it's terrible, but it's almost hopeful in the sense that it like kind of suggests that even in something so big, something so small can have, can be incredibly impactful. That's a hopeful message to you. Well, otherwise, like what, what, what do, the, what do each of these human beings, like what do they matter? Can they matter set against the okay. infinite landscape of, I guess, outer space? yeah, it's a double edged sword, I guess. Like, right. Yeah. Even, even an individual person can matter and make a difference, but and, also, it's like everything is so fragile. Yeah. Which is kind of like sad but nice. Uh-huh. And like a lovely sort of observation. Yeah, agreed completely. Um, so I think all of that, the meteor, the spaciness of it, I think that's all really interesting. Mm-hmm. I remember this other really like sad but nice line that I liked. Uh-huh. So Aurora has gone on this trip knowing, like, that she's leaving her family behind. I guess everyone, you know, to some extent, all these passengers are leaving a lot behind, but I guess in this the future they have, I'm going to say, sort of like Harry Potter-type pictures that you can watch, like a video. We basically, uh, GIFs. But, yeah. This is like Harry Potter. Yeah. I, I say it. Yeah. But, yeah. She has one of her, uh, of her mother, who she left behind on Earth, and... She's watching it at one point, and you get to see it, and her mom says, I promise we'll think of you every day. When you wake up, I know we'll be gone, but you just know that we lived our lives remembering you and holding you in our hearts. I thought that was, like, really... It's kind of beautiful. ...heart-wrenching, but, yeah, awesome. Well, and the last part, or the implication from Aurora's mother that there is something that Aurora is setting out to find that she doesn't have in her present life Mm -hmm. is kind of like a revelation because we, because before she seemed very, when talking to Jim, she seemed very certain uh, certain about, uh, certain and literal, I guess, about her objective, which was to write this article. Yeah. um, Be like the first person to really do this tremendous journalistic feat. Yeah. Um, But this kind of implies something on a more existential or spiritual or something level yeah yeah right? like a sense of wanting searching it's it's impressive and and uh like noteworthy i would say that the script gives her that much backstory and and fleshes it out enough that she really does feel almost even more real than jim i think they're both fleshed out in very different ways aurora gets much more of the backstory like this Jim, I think we just humanize a lot more by just seeing him a lot more and sharing all that time alone with him in the beginning. Right. And that's that's enough. That's fine. But it's it's cool that they're able to do it in different ways for the two different characters, and both both of them 
ultimately are very realistic feeling and, and fleshed out. Definitely. I mean, it's two characters, but they're both, I think, very strong characters. Yeah. Um, and I think on screen, Jim's, like, dilemma, like, whether or not to wake her will be pretty agonizing for the viewer. If it does, like, stretch, you know, the first mm -hmm. 30, 40 minutes of the film. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, should we say our verdicts? Sure. Do you want to go first? No, because I don't even know what it is yet. I should have uh, thought about it in advance. Do you plan, like, before we even start recording, do you know what your verdict is? I have some sense. I'm, uh, yeah. I'm always open to the possibility that my mind has changed. Okay. Um, but I, I really like this a lot, and that didn't change. I like that. You didn't really betray that too much in talking about it. I, I mean, I guess I said it in so you, many words. You did, but I, I didn't know how much you liked it. Um, I mean, I thought it really articulated its themes well. It has a potentially really visual and exciting. It has great two great characters. Um, and I think it kind of gets at the complexity of its themes without being overly... Explo Exploitative? No. No? Without explicating them too clearly. Oh, okay. Explicitly, I guess. Yes. Without being too explicit about it. Um, so, yeah, I would, uh, I guess, recommend both. Wow. Yeah. If I had a checkbook, I'd bust it out and I'd try and buy this baby <laughs> and attach. Uh, that's a pretty. That's gonna have to Jennifer, be pretty... Jennifer Lawrence, Chris Pratt. I'm cool with them. Yeah, that's yeah. gonna be a fat, yeah, a fat be, check. Might be a fat check. Um. All right. Well. Yeah, I liked it for sure. Um, not as much as you though. I, the the thing about all of the passengers or a lot of the passengers dying, that whole argument I was trying to make, which maybe you have swayed me slightly but i still think that was a cheap ploy to create action and suspense in the ending um that brought it down for me a little bit and right. so, so did some of the humor thought it was out of place at times um i would i would say maybe maybe consider on both sure i, I almost would say recommend on the script but definitely not just for the writer um because I think the premise is really great. That, I think, is the best thing it has going for it. Um, it's kind of a high-concept premise, yeah. but it, one with some substance to it. Yeah, yeah. Or the potential for substance. So, yeah, I guess I'll say consider on the, on the writer and the script. One, if I can add one thing. Yeah. I liked how there's really no... Like, villain, I guess. Oh, yeah. Like, there's no one... Like, Jim obviously does... A, he can be the villain, but he's the main character. He does the worst thing in the screenplay, by far. Yeah, sure. By by choosing to wake up Aurora. But he's also the protagonist, and he's also humanized, and we as the audience, if we can't sympathize with why we with uh, why he did it, we can understand where he's coming from. Yeah. Um, I think that's so important, and that is part of why I always disagree with people who complain about characters not being likable. He's not necessarily likable all the time, Jim. No, and he, Yeah, not. obviously people aren't going to agree with what he did. But yeah, as long as you can understand it, I think that makes it compelling to read or to watch. I really dislike the criticism that this character is too unlikable or something. Yeah. Like... You walk around in the world, a lot of people are not are, are pretty unlikable. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Also, that doesn't make them any less of a compelling character. Yeah. Okay, next week on... I do that every yeah, time. I don't want to do it that way. I'm just going to say next week we're reading. Yeah. Okay, next On the next episode uh, of okay. Offscreen. Of Offscreen still sounds weird. Oh, okay. Next time, no... That doesn't work either. Whatever. The... No. I'm just... When this podcast returns in a week's time... <laughs> Which is called Off Screen. We will be... <laughs> it's the name of the podcast. We will have read a screenplay called... Now, now don't step on my line here. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Next week, we're reading a script called Passengers, again. This time by G.J. Press. 
microscopic proteins slash aliens ride human beings as passengers for their own personal enjoyment. 